Hi, my name is Jeff Solheim with Solheim Enterprises, and welcome to our Trauma Certified Registered Nurse or TCRN exam review course. Children have a disproportionately large tongue compared to a fairly small oral cavity. Not that hard, but what is the difference? Or uh, how is that going to make a difference in your trauma care, knowing that they have a big tongue and a small oral cavity? Well, of course, if the tongue is big and the oral cavity is small, the tongue takes up more room, which just means they have a much higher risk of developing obstructions in the airway from anything in the mouth, whether that is vomitus or blood or anything. So you're going to need to suction them a lot more aggressively if they have things in their mouth because there's less room there for air exchange. Now the second thing is that infants are obligate nose bleeder, uh, breathers, so they, they have to breathe through their nose. They can't breathe through their mouth. Have you ever tried that, to plug a little child's nose? Um, and they get really anxious because they can't breathe through their mouth. They're obligate nose breathers. Why would that make a difference in trauma care? Well again, in the really young infant, if there's blood or other secretions in the airway, they need to be suctioned out to reduce respiratory distress. Have you ever seen a kid who's really snotty and they really have trouble breathing? It's because you and I, if we had a really snotty nose, well, number one, we'd blow it. But number two, until you blow it, you just breathe through your mouth. Kids can't do that. So we have to make sure we'd use bulb suction or other suction to clean those noses out. Another thing about the child is that their airway cartilage is very soft. And of course, their neck muscles are poorly developed. I mean, think about holding a child up by the chest, an infant up by the chest, their little heads bob everywhere, right? Because their neck muscles aren't developed. So they have soft air, uh, um, airway cartilage and poorly developed neck muscles. Now, why does that matter? What's the significance? Well, what I really am thinking about here is the potential for um, causing airway obstructions due to head positioning. It's not uncommon if a child has a reduced level of consciousness that we're going to want to tip their head back to open their airway. However, because their neck muscles are poorly developed, we can crank their heads back a lot further than the adult who has the bigger muscles. And a child's tracheal cartilage is softer. It's kind of like a garden hose. If you, if you kink a garden hose too far, you kink it off. Well, a child's head can go much farther back than an adult's, and then because that cartilage is, um, of the trachea is softer, it can kink like a garden hose, and you can actually kink their little airways off. So that's where we you know, use what's called the sniffing position. Think about if you walk in the house and you smell something good. What, what position do you put your head in? You tip it just far enough back to get a good whiff, right? And that's called the sniffing position. So when changing a child's uh, head position, to open their airway, you shouldn't extend it any farther than that sniffing position. Another difference with children is that the sternum and ribs of children are very soft and cartilaginous. Now, why might that matter? Well, the bottom line is kids, um, kids' ribs don't break very easily because they're soft. They got a lot of give. You can squish their little chests without breaking their ribs which means that the underlying cardiothoracic structures are less protected and more vulnerable to injury, but it also means that kids rarely get broken ribs. Um, and so um, you, your, your child can have a, a chest trauma with no broken ribs, yet significant underlying injury. And if a child does have broken ribs, you can make the assumption that they had significant injury. Broken ribs are actually often associated with abuse, especially, especially abuse of brain injury or shaken babies. So consider that with broken ribs. We also know that the, the, the chest of a child is very small. Now, what, significant is it, what significance does that have on trauma care? Well, the bottom line is with the small chest, breath sounds could easily be transmitted from one side of the chest to the other across a non-inflated lung. So if I try to auscultate on the front of the chest and this lung is collapsed on the left because the distance between the left and the right is so small in a child, I may hear the breath sounds from the inflated right lung across the, the, the pneumothorax on the left and falsely think there's breath sounds on the left. So the best way to avoid this is to use the mid-axillary line for um, auscultation because if you auscultate under the arms, the, there's the greatest distance between the lungs and a least likely um, chance that that lung sounds will be transmitted from one uh, side of the chest to the other. 
Another unique thing about children is that their diaphragm is fairly flat. It's not dome shaped like ours is as adults. So what significance does that have, a flat diaphragm? Well, the bottom line is that gastric distension is more likely to push up against the diaphragm because it's not domed. So therefore, if there's any gastric distension due to, like, say, retained air from crying or bleeding in the peritoneum and it pushes up, it's more likely to push the diaphragm up and that can impede the child's respiratory um, abilities. So for that reason, decompressing the abdomen becomes more important in the child because they're more likely to have diaphragmatic um, pressure due to the flat diaphragm from anything in the, in the um, abdomen, and that can lead to respiratory difficulties.